Hello and welcome to the Logistics and Retail webinar today. I'm Amanda Chu, the Joint Vice, Vice Chair of the Logistics and Retail Group. The Logistics and Retail Group um, have over 4,000 members worldwide in logistics, retail and warehousing. There are many events that we've got planned over the next 12 months, so please watch out for them on our LinkedIn page. And why are we here today? The latest health and safety um, statistics show us that 480,000 workers are affected by work-related MSDs and 8.9 million uh, days are lost. The guest speaker today is Chris Quarry, who's um, a health and safety inspector for the health and safety executive, and he's uh, had 17 years experience of uh, MSDs and a specialist in human factors and ergonomics. And he's in, assisted in site inspections and provided regulatory advice, as well as providing the expert advice on control measures for prevention of workplace M MSDs. If you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A box and we'll try to get through as many as we can today. My colleague Lee Bennett will monitor the questions and present them to Chris at the end of this presentation. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris Quarry, our guest speaker. Chris, that's over to you. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, I will just um, share my screen. One second. Okay, hopefully everyone could see that. Yes, um, my name's Christopher Quarry. Uh, I'm an ergonomist based in the health and safety executive based in Bootle in Liverpool. Um, I've been looking at the topic of MSDs for a number of years now with a little short stint um, looking at advice on human factors for the oil and gas industry as well. But I've moved back into my original role looking at musculoskeletal disorders and their prevention. So to cover what we are going to talk about today, we're going to talk about what are musculoskeletal disorders or MSDs as I will refer to them from now on, um, what HSE assessment tools are available. We've got a little case study and a work example, which I'll run you through. I'll be introducing the new HSE interactive tool, um, which is available to view on the HSE website. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And at the end, any questions or answers. During my presentation as well, we're going to be doing a little poll, but I will introduce that um, when I get to that slide. Um, I apologize now if I'm teaching people to suck eggs because the HSE assessment tools have been available for some time now. So I spoke to Amanda and the rest of the team. We thought, well, if people haven't used them for a while, maybe it's a little refresher. Or for those who've not seen them before, then at least it can give them a good start into how, how to use the assessment tools for musculoskeletal disorders. We'll mainly be focusing on the manual handling assessment tool, tool the MAC charts. Okay, so I'll let you read that slide because it's a bit long-winded, but what are musculoskeletal disorders? Well, really, they're just injuries or pain in the system, including the joints, ligaments, muscles, nerves, tendons, and any part of the body that can affect the back, the upper limbs, the lower limbs. Um, examples of MSDs include carpal tunnel syndrome. You, you'll have heard of that. But people experience that when they do a lot of things with their DSE use, things like that. Epicondylitis. Um, and lateral epicondylitis you've heard of the relate to some sports injuries such as um, tennis elbow golfer's elbow things like that depending on which side of the elbow it, it is affecting back pain is the one you most uh, commonly hear about tension neck syndrome and hip and knee arthritis so there are a broad range of uh, musculoskeletal disorders so what we're going to do i'd like you just to sit back uh, for a second and consider yourself have you ever ever had an msd and what i'd like you to do is vote on the poll and um, whether yes or no you have what was the severity of it was it slight little discomfort moderate discomfort or severe discomfort what do you think caused it is interesting was it your work activities was it leisure a bit of both or you're not unsure or you're unsure where it come from uh, and the main thing is, what impact did it have on your work or your quality of life? Um, a little bit about myself, a, a year or two ago, I had a thing called uh, piriformis sciatica. And I used to, it used to affect my driving. I used to go into meetings in work and then I'd sit down for a while and all of a sudden I'd feel intense pain in the back of my leg. 
Um, and I'd find that I wouldn't be able to concentrate on what was going on in the meeting because my mind was drawn towards the pain and I was struggling a little bit with it. More importantly, driving because I'd lose a little bit of sensation in my left leg, uh, sorry, my right my right leg. I was using that to operate the accelerator and brake and I, I was struggling a little bit because I was heavy braking and things because I'd lost a bit of feedback um, to what I was doing. So it did have a real impact on my way. Luckily, um, I was one of these cases where I went to physio, I got back to um, doing a bit of fitness and things like that. And um, I got back to normal work activity. So I kind of managed it with the help of a physiotherapist. So what we're saying here is not all MSDs are, you know, it's going to be the end of everything. They can be managed. Um, but what you do in work, can affect it and with the right control measures they can be prevented to some extent okay so amanda's just taking uh, just spoke to you about some of the stats there these are taken from the latest labor force survey um, and amanda mentioned there was 480,000 people uh, workers sorry suffering from a musculoskeletal disorder 8.9 million working days lost and this is why the government are asking the hse to focus on musculoskeletal disorders because they're costing a lot of money to society. An interesting stat here, actually, and I've watched this change over the years, um, I feel a bit long in the tooth now, but if you notice, 37% of people reported pain in the back, where 44% reported pain in the upper limbs or neck. When I first started at HSE all them years ago, um, and even like five or whatever years into my time at HSE, the backs were the main cause of concern because back uh, people report more pain in the back than they were the upper limbs and neck. But I've noticed there's been a little bit of a shift in the statistics and now upper limbs and neck. Now, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm hazarding a guess of what's causing this, but I don't know whether uh, work is changing. So people are doing more upper limb intensive activities, maybe more computer work, maybe more um, office-based type work, or maybe... Um, work the physical work for the, that were causing the back injuries the manual handling type work maybe that's reduced maybe people are putting in more control aids maybe materials are getting lighter things like that i'm not sure but it's been an interesting shift over the years that we've got a lot well not a lot less we've got less back and um, people reporting back pain than they have upper limbs or neck so just something to think about why why, why there's been a shift from that to upper limbs I probably think there's more sedentary type work, more typing work, more computer based type work, but I don't know. So what is the approach to musculoskeletal disorder management? Well, really, it's based around the regulations, but we ask duty holders to identify, you know, what are you, what is your hazardous manual ha uh, handling activities or upper limb disorder activities? And that's looking at indicators. So you might get things like people complaints, um, absences, things like that. So what we're saying is, and the regulations say this, my next slide will cover this, is you need to avoid hazardous tasks as far as reasonably practical. Then the next stage is the ones that you can't avoid, you need to assess. And this is the main crux of what we're going to be talking about today. Once you've done your assessment, you need to prioritize your tasks. So, OK, this one needs, you know, res resolving first, putting in control measures here, reducing the hazardous nature, nature of the task. And then you need to eliminate or reduce. So can you provide equipment, lifting aids, change the process, uh, all sorts of handling aids out there. And then you move on to managing um, the residual risk. And this is what comes in with your training and um, safe operating procedures. Uh, and things like that. With relation to training, I often visiting visit sites where they tend to rely on training as their manual handling control. Um, and that's not the case. What they need, uh, what companies need to do is follow the hierarchy measures that's in the manual hand operation regs. And then the training comes in to support all the measures you've taken beforehand. So it's avoid, assess, reduce, and then the training comes in because the training, I'm not ruling out training, training is essential because it stops people lifting and handling stupidly. But it can also be used to train in the safe working methods that have been applied. And that might even be the use of um, handling aids and things like that. I apologize for this slide. I'll give you time to read it, but there's a point um, to it. So basically, manual handling operation regulations, Reg 4 says, as far as reasonably practical, and it's this just follows the previous slide, avoid the need for anyone to take manual handling operations that involve a risk of the being injured. That's always not possible. We know that we're not stupid, but what we're saying is, employers have a duty to make a suitable and sufficient assessment of the manual handling operations that have and have regard to the factors which are specified in column one of schedule one to these regulations. 
and consider the questions that are specified in the corresponding entry in column two. And then the next stage down is take appropriate steps to reduce the risk of injury. Now, what I find on site a lot of times is um, companies do do risk assessments, but they don't um, regard factors which are specified. And I'll come on to the factors in column one and schedule one to the regulations. They are quite generic um, risk assessments, um, often in um, engage in other just generic assessment types. So for a, an assessment to be suitable and sufficient, it needs to um, have regard to the factors which are specified in um, column one of schedule one and then answer the questions in schedule um, column two of that schedule. So what are these? I think most of you will have heard of the tile approach or some people call it light approach. And this is schedule one of the manual handling operations regulations. So really, what they're, they're looking at the task, and does the task involve um, holding or manipulating loads at distance from the trunk, twisting, stooping? Then it looks at the load. Are they heavy, bulky, unwieldy? So what can changes can you make to that? The working environment, you know, are the postural constraints? Um, is a floor surface level? You know, is there a chance of slipping? Um, and then you're looking at the individual itself. So basically, the schedule Schedule one follows a tile approach, which I'm hoping most people are familiar with because I remember when I'd done my knee bosh and things like that, that was a thing which was promoted as part of that. So when you're doing your risk assessment, just consider, and we'll move on to the MAC charts and things like that in a minute, but consider that the risk assessments do need to include the factors that are in schedule one of the, um, of the regulations. Right, okay, um, here is a bog standard manual handling task sit down, have a think, um, what do you think are the key manual handling risk factors here? It's just really, this is just an introduction into getting your mind thinking about the key risk factors for manual handling. Um, you can put them down on the comments, whatever you fancy doing. I'll just leave this on for a couple of minutes because we've got the next one. I just want to really get you engaged into the, the manual handling thoughts. So here are some of what I think they could be. So you've got a plastic um, dip, um, bucket there, so it could be in a stable, unstable load, lifting at head height, um, potentially a poor grip, you know, they've not got a good grip on the load. In the environment, it could be a slippery floor. And of course, obviously, it could be a heavy weight. We don't know what the weight is, but that's um, just getting into a feel of what the uh, risk factors could be. We've got a little lady here with blacked out eyes. I'm not too sure why, but um, if you could... Think about uh, any of the risk factors here. Look, look at the posture of the lady. Look where she's lifting from, um, where she's lifting to. Okay, so we've got potentially a heavy weight. Again, another poor grip on the load. Look at the posture, uh, back bent forwards, twisting slightly. Potential uneven floor being on a pallet, one foot on, one foot off. And I don't know if you notice the boxes behind. Maybe she's in a rush to get it done. So you're thinking about the, the process rate. So how often is she having to lift and move these? Is she rushed, uh, rushed? So work that's imposed by a process. In other words, she's got to get that done job done quick and really sometimes affect the lifting and the capability of the person doing the task. Okay. Here is um, an overview quickly of the MSD assessment tools. On the left-hand side, we've got the wrap tool, as we call them, the risk assessment for pushing and pulling. So any pushing and pulling activities, roll cages, pallet trucks, things like that, we've got a wrap tool to cover the risk associated with that. We've got the R tool for, it's called the assessment of repetitive tasks of the upper limb. So people who are doing um, highly intensive upper limb tasks, so they may be working on a conveyor belt, they may be picking, they might be sorting tasks, uh, things like that. Anything which involves uh, repetitive map, uh, movements of the upper limbs, we've got that. Obviously, the R tool is not used for DSC work. I mentioned DSC, uh, display screen equipment, work before. Um, we've Obviously, we've got the DSC regulations that cover that. So... The R tool is for anything that involves the repetitive tasks using the upper limbs. We've got the MAC tool, which we'll be talking about in more depth here. Um, so basically, this is, tool, uh, this is a tool used for your manual handling um, activities. Um, and finally, we've got the MAC and the VMAC, or the VMAC, sorry, I should say. 
The VMAC is used for items which vary considerably. So they might be you use a VMAC in places like picking warehouses and things like that, where you might be picking anything from, I don't know, um, um, some butter, small box of butter, all the way up to a TV or something. So distribution warehouses, things like that. Um, the VMAC really, it's quite um, complicated to use. You can find the information on the HSE's website. You have to put in the details of the item's handle. And then all that does, that will work out the load weight frequency. And then you use the MAC chart then to you to put in the other um, risk factors. So for instance, hand distance from low back vertical lift region, things like that. So uh, the VMAC's there to help out people who are handling loads that whose weights di um, differ significantly. The mat chart is really for things where the, the, the load weight is regular. So they might be unpacking from palletized loads, things like that. So you can say, okay, well, I know what the frequency, I know what the weight is, we'll use the MAC tool. So overall, uh, we we invented, we invented, we, we derived the uh, MAC tool. In the first instance, we decided, this is many years ago now, we decided on a traffic light approach would be the best way to highlight the high risk elements of each activity. So we've gone for green being safe, uh, amber being medium risk, red high risk, um, et cetera. And then we decided, okay, we've got the MAC tool. We can use the same philosophy for the wrap tool. You'll see this, they have the same format. And then when the R tool was developed, we've got the same green, amber, red. So this enables you to say, well, okay, we've got a few greens. The hand distance from low back is coming out as a, as a red. What can we do to the workplace design to get that load closer to that person? So you may be able to get that down from a green, uh, from a red into an amber or possibly into a green. So it helps you highlight which level, uh, which part of the task is causing the highest level of risk. But what we've also done as well, we've included, um, I call it an aid memoir, but there's like a description and a visual descriptor to help you with your assessment process. Some people use, and there's no, no harm in doing this, they use their, what we call the manual handling checklist um, for doing the risk assessments. And they do follow the tile approach and they'll have questions about the task and they follow what's in the schedule. But it's quite subjective. Um, so for instance, they say that is a load weight heavy and is, is it low, medium, or high as a risk identification? Now, that is quite subjective because to someone who is well-built and they might say, well, lifting 18 kilograms is fine. I can lift 50, 60 kilograms in the gym, no problem. So it depends on the assessor doing it. So the reason we put in these visual descriptions and the verbal advice as well is trying to get some sort of, uh, to reduce the sub subjectivity and get some consistency in your assessment. So... We thought, okay, we'll have a, um, an image of the person and holding the load where it is um, away from the body, this, that, and the other. So it'll give you a steer with what the level of risk should be. And we've done that for the MAC tool, we've done that for the RAP tool, and we've done that for the R tool. It just, as I say, it reduces subjectivity. So where does the MAC and RAP um, and the R tool fit in? Well, you'll have seen in the top right-hand side of this screen here, you'll have seen the box filters. Um, these are just the initial filter to help a duty holder decide whether they are whether they require to do a suitable uh, to, to do an assessment. The Mac and Wrap sit in the, sit in the middle somewhere. So, you know, it, are they outside the filter values? Yes, they are. They'll do a Mac tool, or then they can go on and do a full risk assessment. The Mac or the RAP will more than, like, more than necessarily do a full risk assessment anyway, depending on the task, but we'll move on to that in, in a bit as well. So you've got your filter, you've got your MAC, RAP or R tool, and then you've got your full assessment. Um, you can go from the filter to the full assessment. It's entirely up to yourselves. So moving on to the MAC tool, I mentioned before, they've got uh, different list, lift cat, uh, risk categories. You've got green, low level of risk, amber, medium, high, um, sorry, red high level of risk and purple is a very high level of risk. Um, what you've got in the MAC tool as well, you've got three separate flow charts, one for lifting, one for carrying and one for team handling. So if you've got a lifting operation where a, a person is stored, just lifting all day might be deboxing, palletizing loads, things like that. Use lifting charts. If they're carrying, you use your carrying. And if it's a team handling, you use uh, the team handling chart. The MAC tool, by the way, is not uh, applicable to patient handling. Um, 
you have, um, I think it's called HOP6 um, um, for that to do the risk assessment for patient handling. So obviously lifting a person, you're going to be having load weights in the very high level of risk. So um, this is more for factories, construction type work and not, not lifting and moving of patients. So basically, as I mentioned before, it's a simple flow chart. We looked at some videos before. We looked at, you know, um, sorry, we didn't look at videos. We looked at those images before. We got the load weight. We got the hand distance from low back. Where were they lifting to and from? Twisting, sideways bending. The lady was bending down. Postural constraints. So where, where are you lifting into? Where are you taking the loads from? You can get severe postural constraints if, for instance, if you're leaning into shelving, something like that, where you can't actually adjust your posture to handle load, grip on load, lifting sacks, things like that is a lot more difficult than lifting uh, 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 your normal bog standard box, tote box, whatever it might be, uh, floor service. So all them um, risk factors we spoke about before, all we've done is we've put them in a flowchart format and for each one we've graded each, the level of risk of each element, uh, each risk factor. So load weight frequency, you say, well, okay, what is that person lifting? In this case, it's about 30 kilograms. You say, well, okay, how often are they lifting it? Just count and they'll say, well, it's a, you know, they're moving this once every, what's that, three minutes, something like that. So for the load weight frequency, you're, you're in the amber zone. You go back to your chart and you can see there that your first risk factor is done as, as an amber. You move on to your next risk factor. You look at the person doing the task. You say, okay, well, where's the load away from the body? Well, it looks like their upper arms are angled away from the torso slightly there. So we'll give that an amber. So you move on to the next one, you've got an amber. The next one you say, well, okay, if they're lifting from the pallet, they're stood on the pallet, are, are they lifting at floor level or below? Well, basically they are about floor level. Where are they lifting to and from? Well, yeah, to get to that top shelf or whatever, they are going to be lifting at head height or above. And so you've got your descriptor there. And again, you put it into your boxes, vertical lift region of at, at head height. What a, a top tip I always say is um, always base it on the worst case scenario, because if you are um, doing a MAC assessment of someone un unloading a pallet, at some point the loads are going to be at waist height, but at some point they're going to have to be lifted from, from pallet height when they're lifting the lower level of boxes. This is why we say pallet raises and things like that are useful because you can keep things at waist height and therefore the, the vertical lift region will always be within the, um, the green zone. Okay, excuse me. So at the end of your assessment, you've got a score sheet. Um, you fill in the company name, you look at the activity, who's doing the job, in this case, it's John Smith, um, what items are handled, and you do that. If you notice on the top right, it says, do I need to do a full risk assessment? So there are certain activities which are not included in the MAC, um, which are within schedule one. So what we say is if any of those are included, you're probably best doing a full suitable and sufficient risk assessment. It gives you the link to the online checklist there. They're called CK5. So if you just type in CK5 on the HSE website, you'll get them there. Um, so it gives you a steer really of when you need to do a MAC and when you need to do um, a full risk assessment, which is slightly better than what we had in the, in the older version of the um, MAC tool. So what you do, you've got your score sheet. I'll fill the, the, the in for you here. So basically, you've got you know your load rate fr frequency. It's a carrying task in this instance. So you've got scores and a red ri risk um, donation there. So we carry it a red risk factor. It's a score of six. Hand distance from low back. They're obviously loading the whole load close to the body. It's a zero. Is a twist in sideways bending? Yes, it is. That's a three. Blah blah blah. And then you go all the way down to you get to the, your time, final score. So this is where a lot of people get slightly confused with the scoring. What people want is a link between the scoring and risk of injury. And we can't do that. All the scores, the final scores are there are to prioritize remedial actions. So for example, a score of 10 does not mean, oh, that's low risk. Um, because for the first risk factor, load weight frequency, it, they might be lifting an 80 kilogram load as a one-off lift, one person. Now that could 
seriously injure someone just doing that, even if all the rest of the risk factors are fine. So we can't say, and that would come out with a score of 10. So what we're saying is the scores don't link to injury. The scores are there just for prioritizing your remedial actions. So after this, you may say, I'm going to do a few of these manual handling assessment charts um, in my workforce. So you might get uh, come back with five or six assessments. I don't know. Um, and then you've got one job which is coming out with a score of 20, one with 15, one with a 12, one with 10, blah, blah, blah. So you look at the score of 20, you say, OK, this job's coming out as the highest overall risk. What are the high risk factors within this job? OK, load weight frequency, that's coming out as high. Is there any way we could reduce the frequency? Is there any way we could reduce the load weight? Vertical lift region. That's coming out as a red. Well, what can we do? Can we introduce pallet raises so we can keep the load at waist height? Is there any way we can reduce the height of the what we're stacking these to reduce the head height? Things like that. So please don't try and link a score directly to a risk of injury. It doesn't work like that. It just helps you prioritize your remedial measures. Right, okay, I'm going to give you a real life uh, a walkthrough here. It doesn't cover all the risk factors, but I'm just hopefully it'll demonstrate on how quickly you can do these assessments and how easy it is to use. Really, it's this is just a lifting operation. It, I didn't do this job, by the way. It was a job done by a colleague of mine years ago. It's cheese turning, it's called. Um, a little bit about the background. I think um, with my limited knowledge of the cheese industry, it's something to do with kids and whey. This gentleman goes in every morning. He has to turn these casks over. Um, hopefully, you can all see the video. Um, turn these uh, molds over. Sorry, not casks. Turn the molds over. And basically, they let it sink. And it lets the air out of the cheese, I think, and they let it breathe or something. And then he, anyway, he goes in every day. And this is his job. He needs to turn it. So I'll let you watch this just for a minute, see what he's done. What is what he's doing, sorry. What is important to, as mentioned before, about when you're doing the assessment, look at the um, worst case scenario. And you'll notice here, there's some stack low level. And up here, sorry, I'll, when the camera goes back, there's some stacked up um, at head height or above. He has to move them all over from one side to the other but, and turn in each one in turn. So I'll just let you watch this for a second, watch the whole video, and then we'll just run through how quickly we can do um, a Mac assessment. OK, <clears throat> so you've got the um, the load weight of each one of these um, um, containers. I'm not sure I actually call, know what they've actually called. One of these containers is 12 kilograms and he's lifting approximately one lift every five seconds. So <clears throat> you go to your load weight frequency, like I showed you before, you've got 12 kilograms, one lift every five seconds. So it's coming out as a number. So your first risk factor is done, that's a number, 12 kilograms, one lift every five seconds. You move to the next one. This is hand distance from low back. Remembering that there's visual descriptors on the Mac charts as well. He's got to reach right into the shelving, quite a bit away from the body while he's grabbing the load and placing it into the other side. So we'll say, yeah, that's that's probably a, probably a red hand distance from low back. It's quite a bit away from the body. He's um, holding it far away. So yeah, we'll give that one a red. The next one is vertical lift region. Well, I mentioned that kind of prompted you on this actually. Um, look at where he's got a lift from. He's got a lift from around just above, uh, around knee height really for that bottom level. But he's also got to handle some right at the top, which is at head height and above. So again, you go to your your visual descriptors. You're saying, OK, where's he lifting to and from? Pretty much at head height. Vertical lift region, give it a red. You move on to your next one. Can anyone see it? Oh, sorry. 
Trump twist and sideways bending. Well, he's twisting quite a lot, really. Um, he's he's feet are held static. One of the issues here is the position of the of the aisles themselves. They're located so that it encourages a person to actually plant his feet, swing from one way to the next, which encourages a trunk twist and sideways bending. Would they be if they were slightly further apart? By the way, there are better solutions, but slightly better apart. They would be able, you'd be able to pull a load, pick it up, turn around, walk towards it and slide it in. But it's actually encouraging him to swing from side to side and encourage this twins twisting and sideways bending. Next one, you move to your next risk factor, which is postural constraints. Can anyone see any postural constraints there, considering where he's got to lift to and from? We've given that a number. Um, again, in the MAC charts, the visual... Uh, uh, the, the verbal descriptions they talk about well what is a severely risk restricted posture and that's really where you can't adjust your posture at all so you might be working i don't know in them um, luggage holds in planes and attics moving rock wall things like that where you can't actually stand up and um, uh, sellers in in pubs and things like that where you really are restricted we've given that a number for that one <clears throat> and then you go through the rest of the risk factors Grip on load, we've given Amber, he can clamp it. It's not the greatest, it's slopping around a little bit within it, but it's not the worst because um, he can actually grip onto the load. Floor surface, obviously, it's um, poor floor surface. He's got the right PPEs, not much you can do, maybe have better drainage. And environmental factors, oh, I should have told you that, actually, but it's a slightly cool environment, but again, so there you go. We've run through it. You've done your assessment. Um, We've gone through each of the risk factors. You go to the end, you put all your risk factors um, down in your score sheet. You come out with a total score of 20. What did we say about the score? The score doesn't really mean much in terms of risk of injury. What are the um, main risk factors? Um, well, hand distance from low back, vertical lift zone, uh, twist and sideways bending. We mentioned that before. And the floor safe as well, if he's got the right PP on and things like that, they could actually drain it, but it's not too bad. Can anyone think of a potential solution for doing this? Uh, you, you can either comment or just have something in your mind. We, we, we did talk about how to do it. This video, what I'm going to show you now, is not um, the video of the same premises, but we said, look, this is capable and this other site, uh, this cheese making site, um, Perhaps you could include it into your premises and they did do on an ongoing basis. So here we go. Please work. Oh, sorry. I think I've got to play this. So look what we've done here. Obviously, we haven't eliminated the manual handling because someone has to put the moulds into the, 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 the twirly, I call them bookcases, but mould holdings. Um, but really what they've done, they've eliminated most of the manual handling. So they've loaded them in and each day you just have to turn them around and then they they can do the stuff, whatever the cheese needs to do to uh, breathe properly. So a simple solution. Um, and it's eliminated the need for that person to go in every morning and turn them cheeses. So often the solutions are simple. Um, I just hope that gentleman doesn't get any entrapment type injuries um when turning the um when turning them but obviously from a manual handling perspective it's so much better than what you've seen on the other video Ooh. okay so i'm now going to do a bit of promotion here for the hsa what we've got now we've got uh, an online version of the tools and basically you can do your assessments now using your ipads and your phones and things like that um, they're all available from the HSE website. Um, I think they're getting launched and um, there's a few accessibility issues. Um, I've, I've not been directly involved in this. This is something that my colleagues in Science Directorate have been involved with, with um, our publishers TSO. Um, there will be a priced version um, and there will be a free version. The priced version gives you a lot more feedback and things like that and how to prioritise. But really what, what you do is you do your assessment using your iPad so you can actually go out on site and you can fill it in as a person's doing the task. And this is really what it looks like on your screen, on your computer or on your... So you fill it in as you're watching the task. And then you fill, you get your um, 
your results at the end. And then what happens is then they actually email you the result back to yourself. So you can put a number of people involved in that e email. So you put in, oh, you know, I've been down to such and such um, warehouse of risk assesses, and then you can send it to your senior safety manager, whoever it might be, but you've got like a, a, a recorded version of that assessment, whereas currently they are quite paper-based at the moment. So this is really a step forward in um, in what we can get. What they can do as well is this is more of the, um, the, the, the paid for version is it's suggested priorities for improvement. So it can take a number of assessments. So you might work for a company that is a multi-site company. So they can be uploaded and you might say, well, you know, we're having quite a few issues on this site with this particular job where it's not too bad here. So it gives you more feedback and it actually links into, it groups your assessments for you to say, this assessment's coming out as the highest risk assessment at this site doing this specific job. So it allows a company-wide um, risk control strategy rather than just you doing one with your paperwork or possibly your video camera whatever it is so it gets you it gives you more of a corporate feedback for your manual handling assessments so the advantages of the online version what we've found is um that it's the, the faster assessments um, shaves off a couple of minutes per assessment um, it's easier to communicate risk assessment outcomes with others, as in you can send them to the line managers, things like that. So you do the assessment and say, look, we could have an issue. We're going to have to have a look at that. Is there anything you can do as a line manager? Um, feed this back to your staff. Is there any way you can do anything to improve the task? Uh, you can have more assessors and it's easy to share, as I mentioned before, um, across the uh, across the organization. Um, and the paid for version, which I've not had too much involvement with, is apparently it gives a dashboard system which helps prioritize and date assessments for you, gives an overview view of them by the task, the department, the region, and shows uh, some sort of commonality. So you might have an issue specifically on a packet line in all our factories. What do we need to do there? Apparently, as I said, the accessibility of now issues have now been resolved. I think it was we had some issues with people who may be visually impaired and the colors. Um, and I think we've got around that now. So I'm assured they're getting launch, launched soon. But here's how to find out more. And uh, this, this presentation will be available at the end. So you, and you can actually register for a free live webinar demonstrating the tool. Uh, it shows videos of the tool in actions. So you've got a Mac tool for you to try. And um, you get, um, <clears throat> there's a price list to actually get the premium version. Okay, so the key message, it was a bit of a whirlwind to, uh, tour that. If I would have done the um, R tool, to be honest, I would have been here for two hours because that's a little bit more intricate than the Mac tool. But that was just a demonstration to show you how quick and easy the um, Mac tool is for assessing manual handling risk. So basically, assessment is vital for MSD uh, risk management. It informs you on how how um, how risky a manual handling task is, but more importantly, it's, it helps you implement what proportionate controls are available, um, are, sorry, are required, because at the end of the day, you can do all the assessments in the world. It's actually controlling the risk, which makes a difference. If I was to have a pound for how many sites have been on that, they've given me all singing, all dancing risk assessments. I've had files shoved in front of me, this, that, and the other. I said, that's brilliant, but what have you done? How have you controlled the risk? Because doing the assessment is only one end of the, uh, one, there's the start of the process. I've been to sites where the assessments have been hopeless, yet the controls have been brilliant. I'd rather see good controls, but assessment is vital to help you steer what, uh, what controls are required. Stick to the assessment formats. They're going to get um, easier with the electronic versions, which I've mentioned before. So if you follow the the Mac or the Art or the RAP tool in the MSD risk assessment tools, you get some sort, you, you reduce the subjectivity and you get consistency in your assessments. So hopefully it'll give you a realistic um, representation of the level of risk of the task. And your workers are the best resource. 
and that is that's the key thing we need to get out of there talk to your workers workers often have brilliant workarounds to issues they'll often have they'll know which jobs they hate I, I remember working in supermarkets when i was at university i remember working in pubs i know the jobs which i didn't want to do that i tried to palm off on everyone else the workers are your best source of resource uh, are your best resource so here are a few uh, useful links um this is a TUC, um, the first one is a signpost and document for all MSD information. It was one thing I find with the HSE's uh, website as well, um, I'm going to be a bit critical here, but I find it quite hard to navigate through to find things. So this TUC resource actually steers you. So if you want to look at upper limbs, it gives you the different level of documentation you can go to. You've got HSE's MSD website and for them st um, stats, which I provided before and Amanda gave, there's more uh, there's more of a detailed breakdown there. So if you want to have a look at your sector, your specific um, type of industry, then you can have a look there to see if you can pull out some stats for your own use. Right. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for inviting me along. I think now I did introduce a, a poll earlier on, so I will stop sharing my window now and we'll have a look at the poll and then I think we're going to move on to um, a question and answer session. So um, thank you very much. I will just... Hi Chris. Hi, you okay? Yeah. Not oh, there we, yeah. there we are. Yeah. Uh, super, uh, trying to condense all that into 40 minutes, you know, I think we all realise that you could spend days if not weeks on, on these particular topics. Mm -hmm. um, one one thing that I did this morning, and, and I, I had to double take, um, the manual handling regs are nearly 30 years old. 1992, yeah. 1992, I, I, I had to calculate that two or three times because I'm thinking, no, surely not. We so, Some of the uh, more mature people like, like you and I would, would remember them coming out as a six pack. Um, yeah. So, so a, quest, a question I've got for you is, is if those regs are, are 30 years old, why do we think that manual handling is still the second highest cause of workplace injury? Well, it's a good, it's a very good question. Um, I think one because manual handling is 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 still going on out there. You know, we, we can't eliminate all handling. Um, people's body changes, things like that. Um, we can't control all manual handling, and there still is some poor examples. I mean, it's my job, and I, I go out. Um, I know for a fact, you know, in construction and things like that, we have, you know, very high risk manual handling activities. And even in some sites where I've visited, it could actually be controlled better. People just aren't. And the, the regulations have been around for a while. It's just, I think, from a personal uh, perspective, for, particularly when thinking about our regulatory inspectors, looking at safety issues is easier to look at than health issues. And so, for instance, that you, you can go on a construction site, you can nail down scaffold because you can see is there edge protection is is a not sort of thing. Um, whereas health issues are a little bit more tricky to decide. But there's also is a cultural change, particularly in construction. There's a lot of you know uh, there's a culture, there's a, a macho culture. Um, I've done a lot of work with dry liners, plasterboard workers, and it, it, a lot of the conditions that it, it, if they're not aching at the end of the day. It's they, they don't feel as if they've done a hard enough day's work, and it, it's a strange way of looking at it. But there's no long longevity in it. They they want to make the money, they want to work as hard as they can, but they don't see well, well what's going to happen when I'm forty, what's going to happen when I'm fifty. So th that could be all coming into play as well. And do you think it could also be a factor that the manual handling aids aren't readily available? So people think, well, you know what, I've only got to move that from here to there, so I'll I'll just lift it. Yeah, they, they are. There's also still um, a culture in a lot of com companies that visit saying, well, we've always done it this way. What's the problem? People don't want to moan. People don't want to complain. People just want to get on and do the job. So often they're not actually finding out that there's a specific issue until it's too late sort of thing. Um, so handling aids are available. Um, handling aids are quite expensive, if the truth be known. And that, that, that is, you know, and you've got to consider the economy and things like that. Um, they are available, but there's still a culture of, well, you know, we've been doing this job for 30, 40 years this way. What's your problem? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've, <laughs> all, we've all encountered that, that one, haven't we? Yeah. Um, another question. Um, 
when we do a manual handling assessment, we either use uh, tile or light. Yeah. Um, the, the, the individual capabilities. So let's say an organization has 20 employees. Well, individual capability is different for each person. Does that organization yeah. need to do 20 manual handling assessments? Uh, no, no. I think what we would do is if anyone has specific individuals, so maybe they're aware of a, an existing condition or they've had the condition in the past, I would not put them on that that job, so to speak, um, depending on what the job is. Um, I think it, it, it is an element of selection. If, But really what we need to do is go back to first principles again. You need to go back. You need to say, well, OK, look at this job. You know, um, does it need, can it be eliminated in the first instance, the assessment? If at the end of the day you have got to do it, if things cannot be changed, you then go to the selection and don't have a person who have had experience back pain, this, that and the other, whatever it might be, doing that, doing that job. The hard part is being aware of it because people don't like to let people know. Yeah. But if you, you know, so so again, it's just as I say, I'll, I'll reiterate the points like go back to first principles, reduce as far as reasonably practical. If it's still got to be done, then it's a bit of selection, then it's a bit of a training and things like that. Yeah. And that's, uh, another question that sort of came in a little bit later, but is aligned to that. Um, should an employer avoid employing persons with pre existing health conditions? Sort of, uh, uh, um, slightly out of my remit, if you don't mind. That that's mm -hmm. um, it's something which really I can't comment. On. It's um, I forget what regulations that would be, but I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm an ergonomist. I, I look at you know control. I, I, I couldn't really comment on that. Yeah, but I suppose the the, the answer would be you'd, you'd need to see what what kind of work that you're doing in, in that workplace and. and whether or not they would be suitable for that, for that work. Yeah, I, I wouldn't like to get involved with saying someone is uh, ready for employment or not, over oh, if you no, understand no. what I mean. Me neither, me neither. Yeah. Um, do, do you feel as though anything is missing from manual handling training, uh, which could reduce the impact on workers? So we've all, I guess most of us have been on manual handling training, and I guess 90% of us have, have been in a room with someone who shows you how to yeah. lift a box up. Uh, and I, I know someone in the chat said, well, that's great, but you know, we lift mattresses up and downstairs. So yeah. is, is there anything that, that you think could be added or anything that, that you feel is missing from manual handling training that could help to reduce the risks? Um, well, what I say, I mean, the, the business like online training or standing in the room, li lifting a box, that, that sort of training, that's just not, not really appropriate at all. There are a number of excellent manual handling training providers around and they go onto site, they actually see what they're lifting and handling, they work with the people, they, they, they apply excellent principles, they show them about how they should be lifting the various items, so for instance, mattresses, things like that. Um, what I mentioned before about training was is often people resort from we've got um, we've got hazardous manual handling, therefore we need to train them. What they need to do is apply the uh, principles again. How can they reduce that risk? And then the training just then picks up the residual. So, for instance, for the mattresses, if they're carrying mattresses, could they be put on trolleys to stop carrying them? If there's no way they can, they can, by the way, but if there's no way they can, then the training comes in and then they have to be trained in safe lifting techniques for that specific item. Hmm. Yeah, uh, somebody did ask another question saying that spending two hours on a, on a training session learning about the rates is pretty pointless. You need to get out and ensure that you, you're actually training them on the job. So I think that, that was a really good point. Yeah, it, it does. It needs to be task specific and it needs to involve. And as I say, there are, I've got one in mind, but there are, are a number of very, very good manual hand and train as, as well. There'll be a number of duff ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess as the HSE, you're not allowed to recommend any uh, particular training. No, no, no. <laughs> But as, as I say, all, all can reinforce is it, don't go straight from we've got um, a risk to we'll train them um, how to. Because at the end of the day, no one can safely risk uh, lift 80 kilograms, no matter how well all day, no matter how well trained they've been. Yeah. Um, another question came in, which is aligned to, to training. Uh, somebody said they did some job specific training for the client. But then the client said, well, we want a manual handling uh, certificate. Do you, do you think that that's uh, necessary if it's being covered in the in the training, 
would the HSE, for example, if you came in to, to inspect a workplace or a RIDO, yeah. would, you, would you say, can I see your manual handling training? We, we would ask about it, what, what try and kind of training. We wouldn't ask to see any specific um, a, a certificates or anything because we'd say, you know, what I would do if it was me, I'd go through and say, well, okay, you know, let, let me have a look at your assessments. Have you looked at avoiding it? Let me have a look at your assessments. Are they suitable and sufficient to what we mentioned before? Let me have a look at how much you've controlled it. You know, what have you looked at? Um, have you looked at all reasonably practical options? And then moving down the scale, say, well, okay, you've got this risk. How, what, what is your training? You know, how have you gone about training your staff in moving and handling? And a lot of times, uh, all certificates prove is that somebody was in the room. Um, yeah, well, ex room. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as I say, we, we don't recommend one training against another. Um, so whether they produce a certificate or not, we just say, are they trained and, you know, talk to them about the adequacy of that training for that specific role. Hmm. Um, so another question um, about mobile workers and people using smartphones and, and iPads and, and other devices. Is there anything, uh, is there a separate DSE assessment template or tool for people using uh, mobile devices whilst out and about on the road? Um, no, but I do know an ex-colleague of mine. Um, so if you, I think he were, it's called Guilford Ergonomics. And it's a colleague called Ed Milnes, and he has produced um, a document which is very good, and you can get it through the Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors, and it's called Mobile Working. Um, if, if you want to contact me afterwards, I, I can see if I can grab it or something, but it, it, he's does, done a lot on people using iPads, mobiles, and things like that, and, and the specific DSE risks associated with them. We at the HSC are currently reviewing our, um, because of COVID, we've got a lot more people working at home now and things like that. So we've got to do a lot more work on COVID risks. So, um, so, so yeah, so he's done quite a lot of documentation about, you know, the, the, um, the, the risk with using iPhones and iPads and things like that. People working on trains and things, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you have any, any, views on safe lifting limits for men as opposed to women um no i mean the, the, there's no real safe limit well we don't say what's safe we do have an indicator and um, i mentioned it before the filter values um it doesn't de tell you if a task safe it just de de uh, denotes between low risk and high risk because we mentioned before about the individual and how do you assess the individual if someone has had a predisposing, I think uh, it's 25 kilograms is the cutoff point. There's a lot of other parameters you've got to take into consideration, but of, of a load held close to the body. Um, but if you've got someone who's previous back injury, who's, you know, things like that, that 25 kilograms. So I wouldn't say there's any safe limits, but what you get in the filter value is to give you an indication of when an assessment is required. It doesn't deem it being safe. It just means you've got to look into it in more detail. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any views? Oh, sorry, I'm just, the question just jumped off. Uh, do you have any views on, on um, inverted commas, engaging the core when, when manual handling and lifting? Um, is, I presume this is a specific lifting technique, is it, or lifting style? Is it engaging? So it'd be using your stomach muscles. Is that yeah, correct? I, would think, I think so. Um, I'm not a manual handling advisor. I know the principles is keeping a load close to the body and lifting within within the body. Um, I know one specific um, company. I know about they say using your leg muscles, the big engines, as they call it. Um, that's perfectly correct because they're a lot stronger. When they say, I've never heard of uh, lifting with the core before, but I presume it's the same principle as in keeping a load within the base section. Yeah. Um, and what about that one um, where people say, keep your back straight? I always used to say people, your back isn't naturally straight anyway. The no, no. I, I think it says, um, it does say um, moderate flexion in the manual handling regs about the, um, so in other words, don't stoop it. You've got to have moderate flexion um, when you're lifting because, um, you, you actually, I think if you have it straight when you're lifting with your legs, you are putting strain lower back, so you've got to have slight flexion in the back. Um, there's, um, there's a HSE research report called uh, Manual Handling Techniques Achieving a Consensus, and that, that's I, I was involved in that, and we sat with a lot of um, physios, people like that, who looked at the best lifting techniques, and that was one of it. It was uh, regarding about moderate flexion rather than the old theory of uh, keeping your back straight. 
Thank you, Chris. Um, just one last question before, before we wrap up. Um, do you have any views on time and motion studies for warehousing and, and are these likely to have impacted on manual handling industry, injuries? Um, yes, as long as sensible, that they, they will have impacted. I know um, um, the likes of, I think, Amazon places like that, they, they, they follow this a lot. They have a lot of um, time and motion and productivity rates and things like that, um, as long as it's kept at a sensible rate. But if people are working at the peak of their capability and they're not keeping up with the rate of other colleagues, they're likely to put themselves at a risk of injury because they're working beyond their peak capability, their comfortable zone, and therefore exposing themselves to more wear and tear type injuries. Um, what we say is um, work pressures, things like that, keeping up peace rate, things like that, keeping up um, with a system, we kind of discourage that because you might go in one day, you've, yeah, I don't know, you maybe you've, you've done, had a sports incident the night before or something like that. You go in, then you're expected to work when your body's telling you, I don't want to work at that. And then you're going to exacerbate any pre-existing injuries you've got. So we, we, we try and discourage it, but it, it does go on. Yeah, thank you. Um... We, unfortunately, we don't have any time for any more questions. The, the Q&A has gone absolutely berserk. I, I, in all the time doing these, I've never seen so many questions. So thank you to everybody who did ask a question. Unfortunately, we, we, we've only got the hour. Um, Chris, absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, how, how you managed to wrap all that up in 45 minutes, I, I do not know. But, um, but yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. If anybody's got any questions post uh presentation um, you, you can either contact uh, Chris Chris's detail Chris is on LinkedIn you'll find him on, on LinkedIn you'll find myself on LinkedIn uh, Amanda who opened the session she's on LinkedIn and also if you if you can contact the IOSH logistics and retail page through our, through our LinkedIn page um, so that's it Chris thank you and, and thanks to everybody attending uh, a really good good turnout um, and a fascinating subject um, so really I, that, that just uh, allows me to bring the uh, the webinar to a close. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Really, really good. Um, give us a follow on on, on LinkedIn. Uh, Chris is on there. I'm on there. Amanda's on there. As is the iOS Logistics and Retail Group. So um, that formally uh, ends today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Cheers. <laughs>